Welcome to Radical Feminist Perspectives. Um, today we're going to hear about the book Three by Anne Marie Monaghan, discussed by Lier Keith and Marion Rutigliano. Um, and uh, it's it's also looking at the importance of utopian stroke dystopian novels to <laughs> radical feminism. So thanks very much, Lier and Marion, and over to you. Great. Okay, so I'm going to try this all important share screen business, which I always get wrong the first time. So where, where did PowerPoint? Here we go. Okay, but we're not at the beginning. Okie dokie, this one. All right, can you all see that? Yes. Cool. All right. So uh, this book is called Three. It's by Anne Marie Monaghan and full disclosure, it's dedicated to me. <laughs> Anne Marie's my ex and I um, I love this book. I would love it even if I didn't know her because I think it's amazing, but um, I did have a little bit to do with the beginning of this book. So um, anyway, I just feel like uh, the themes in here are, are really crucial ones for radical feminists to deal with. So um, I suggested that we do this little chat. So um, the plot. One spring morning, 17-year-old Catherine North reads these famous lines by T.S. Eliot. She's got her English homework in front of her on the kitchen table, and she's assigned that, you know, the famous poem, Shall I part my hair behind? Do I dare to eat a peach? Um, so this poem is about being afraid. It's about being too cautious to experience life. And so it's perfect for, you know, somebody who's 17 years old, because you're right there at the you know, the beginning of everything and, you know, you're feeling all those intense feelings. And so are you going to live your life? Are you, are you going to actually take the plunge and do this or are you already too hesitant? So that's the question. Does she dare to eat the peach? So the book is fantastical at this point. Um, she, her, her name is Catherine, but she bifurcate, trifurcates into three different people. So the, the concept here is that you can make one decision in your life and everything changes from that point forward. So the reader, we get to see the three different paths that her life takes because she makes a different decision about that peach. So in the first life, uh, her name is, is Kate, but she becomes Antonia. And that is from the Willa Cather novel. Um, she eats the peach. She says, oh yeah, I'm never gonna be afraid. I'm gonna be brave. I'm gonna do the thing. You're not gonna stop me. And so full on, she grabs the peach and then goes on to fall in love with this radical fanatic, uh, Josephine. And they start a utopian women's country, not just like women's land, an actual women's country on a decayed oil platform off the coast of Connecticut. Uh, they call it Atlantis and they're full in. So you get to see what, what that's all about. Um, in the second life, her name is Catherine. She doesn't eat the peach, but not because she's afraid. She doesn't eat the peach because she thinks that this is silly, like that there are way more important things than eating a peach or not eating a peach. Um, and she immediately thinks of the mystics, the Christian mystics who eat nothing but the host and live this really intense life. Um, that would be brave, she thinks, but eating the peach, who cares? Um, so she goes on to have this brief but absolutely life-shattering mystical experience through her sexual attraction to women. Um, and one thing about all three of these characters, when they are much younger, when she is still just the one of her, uh, as a younger child, she has this original mystical experience that, I don't know how many of you have read William James's The Varieties of Religious Experience, but there's four criteria he uses to define the mystical experience, and she, it's all four. So she's definitely full on having a vision. And there's these three beings who come and tell her that you are here for a very strong purpose for a real reason. And they are with all three of these characters, they all still feel that, that mystical experience very much. Anytime she looks to her left shoulder, she can see these three beings who were there for her. Um, and <clears throat> Antonia Kate takes it and runs with it. Like she knows that she was meant to do this great thing. And that's the revolution. You know, She wants that woman's revolution like a lover and she's not ever gonna let go of that. Um, for Catherine, she's, it's, she's a little bit mad about it because she's told, oh yes, you're meant for this great thing, but she's not told what it is. 
So she doesn't really have a calling in that regard the way that Antonia thinks she does. And that, um, that sort of chafes at her through the book. Um, so then she gets to have it again. She kisses this woman named Morgan. And again, she's, it's like the face of God. That's what she says, it, it, that, that is what happens when she kisses Morgan. But Morgan doesn't even like her. So Catherine's, the world of Catherine, the cosmos of Catherine, it's not elves and strawberries. Like the universe is actually, um, it doesn't, it's not that it hates her, it's just completely indifferent to her. And so that's kind of like, it's not what you'd expect. Like it's not, you know, this lovely rainbow, oh, everything is love and light. It's not like that in Catherine's universe at all. It's a much darker, grimmer place than this. Um, anyway, so she gets to have it with Morgan and then everything falls apart and it, because it doesn't work out the way she had hoped. She's really in love with Morgan, but she gets a redo in the, the name of the, this woman, Amanda. They get a month together as lovers and they have these intense, uh, you know, religious theosophical, you know, kind of discussions. And then it, it's utterly catastrophic what happens next. So Catherine's having a hard time. Um, she's also, I think, the funniest of the characters. She's got a really snide sense of humor. I really like her as a person, but um, it's rough being Catherine for sure. And then the third one is Kitty. So she does balk out of cowardice about not grabbing her life in that moment. She doesn't eat the peach. She thinks, well, maybe I'll do it later. And then immediately says yes to a boy who asks her to the prom, even though she doesn't really want to go. Um, ends up pregnant, married at 18, has three kids. She slams the door on everything else. She has to, just to survive being essentially a teenage mom. Gets thrown out of the house, like the whole nine yards. Um, but the peach awaits her. It's, you can run from the peach, you cannot hide. So we get to see what happens to her as well. Um, so anyway, our first theme is the women versus the lives they are living. And Marion picked out three quotes, one for each, each woman. So I'm going to advance to the first one and Marion's gonna talk. Um, yeah, people, people are like fiction. You're gonna talk about fiction? Why talk about fiction? And we were talking beforehand that you can learn and see the same things in fiction that you do, that you see in a, a textbook almost. You can learn about you know, 1900 um, New York City tenements and poverty by reading Jacob Reese's um, essentially journalist book, you know, illustrated book, How the Other Half Lives, or you could read A Tree Grows in Brooklyn, and you will read about the same things and learn about them in different ways, but it's, um, you know, the knowledge from the, from the novel is, is very, very different. Um, so when I, you know, when I, when I read this, um, I see these, you know, I saw the first thing, she's like eating a peach, and I'm like, okay, T.S. Eliot, Alfred Prufrock, that's a, you know, poem it comes from, and it's like, this, this is a, a teenager, an adolescent, and this book is going to be about making a decision, um, <clears throat> and, and, which it is, <clears throat> and, and it took a, um, kind of getting through those first chapters, um, with, with different names to see, okay, um, she's living three different lives, um, but is the same person in each of those lives, um, or does she does she know? I mean, does she know what's happening? Um, and the um, Antonia is the first one. You know, they have uh, Antonia, Antonia one, two, three, all through the book, and then Catherine, and then Kitty. Um, Antonia says, you know, they they push the beacon down. They're on this like, and it took me like like a minute to to say, wait a minute. This, this women's land is on a freaking oil rig platform in the middle of the Atlantic. Well, this is strange. Um, <clears throat> so they, they push this, um, <clears throat> they, they take the beacon down, you know, on the, on the oil rig tower, which is like a safety thing, you know, which is, it's like, you want that there. But they took it out the first, they took it down the first day. Pull, pull, warning light tumbles, everything tumbles. Um, now we're out of range, we're under the radar. And and I thought, well, this is like, this is ultra separatism. I mean, this is, you know, they don't want to be seen. They can't be seen anymore. Um, un but under the radar is like a warfare tactic. So, so Antonia is in this group where she, these women feel like they're at war. Um, and their actions um, really become, you know, as the book goes on, desperate like people at war. Um, so she was, you know, I was like, okay, this woman is like, you know, ultra, ultra separatist, radical, um, and what's this going to be like? And I, you know, 
I didn't particularly like Antonia um, just because she was so um, fixated in in this um, in this culture she became a part of um, that she she couldn't she couldn't see beyond it at all. Um, and I certainly didn't like the life she was living because um, full disclaimer, I would absolutely love you know a world, a country where there was only women um, and never a Y chromosome. <laughs> um, but the but the way they did it, um, and if and if that was the only rule, it's just only women that would be fine. But all this other stuff about you know what you can eat, what you can't eat. Um, oh, we can live on seawater. I mean, all this other stuff. It's just I, I, I you know, and the way they set it up, um, it got to be uh, authoritarian. So didn't like Antonia, and I didn't like the life she was living. You could next slide. Um, Catherine, um, she's at the, you know, Catherine, she's a, she's a physician. I, I, and I didn't like Catherine, again, full disclosure, I'm a physician. And quite frankly, I don't like most of my colleagues. I mean, I really don't. I know what physicians are like. I know, I, I you know, I know um, what it's like when, when one of us starts to, um, um, starts to understand the spiritual aspect of, of people's physical diseases. Um, and Catherine does, but I, you know, the whole rest of it, um, <clears throat> and Catherine just, you know, kind of being a doc, and so it may be personal, but I just, you know, I didn't like her, because um, she was just another one of my colleagues who I generally am not that crazy about, but she has this um, experience, I didn't so much see her, the spirituality so much in her relationships, um, you know, with, with other women, um, although I can understand that, having had a you know, a, a partner that I connected so completely with, but, um, but she has this experience. She's, she's doing this thing at the water's edge, they're digging a shallow bowl on the sand, spirits of the West water. Um, and she says she's uttering such nonsense, um, but I, I didn't think it was. I thought that that was a moment where she really understood um, or, or had, or was reaching out somehow um, for something spiritual, for something more than just the physical ailments of the people they took care of. So I wasn't crazy about her, um, but I, I, I liked the life she was living probably because it was familiar. You know, you're being a doc, um, <clears throat> you, um, you know, you, uh, um, it, it, was, it was just all familiar. So um, this thing she did, it was sort of conservative mag magical thinking. It, it didn't, you know, she didn't, uh, um, she didn't, uh, you know, burn, um, you know, a man in effigy or anything like that. Um, it was fairly conservative, magical thinking. Um, so she won't, she doesn't go as far, she won't go as far as like all the psychic friends network that Antonia wound up in, um, which is part of the book. That's <laughs> what she winds up doing is basically being a phone psychic. Um, Catherine won't go that far, but, but like the first step, the first step was really inside her, you know, this this ceremony that she did, this, this spiritual thing that she did and felt foolish about was actually, and, and that's when I started to, to think that each of these women, you know, it's a book about like them living these separate lives based on, based on, um, you know, a decision they made. <clears throat> but I thought they're, they're in each other. Each of these women is, is somehow in each other in different lives. I wonder if they meet in real life, which it turns out they do. Um, Kitty, on the other hand, so I, 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 you know, didn't like Catherine. Was okay with the life she was living because it was familiar. You can next slide. Hey, I'm trying to get it to advance and it won't. Come on, Kitty. Um, Kitty Behave is in a, um, a a class. Um, and you know she's taking a class. She's you know married mom. She's you know, she married mom. She's got these three kids. So she decides to take this class. There we go. And the class is discussing um, Mrs. Dalloway. You know, Virginia Woolf's book, Mrs. Dalloway. Um, and the, the professor is asking about it, you know, like, what, you know, tell me about Mrs. Dalloway. Who is, who is she? Um, she's a coward, um, Kitty says. She's a coward. It's like, uh-oh, it's just a feeling. And the, you know, the professor's like kind of pulling out the discussion. How is she a coward? Well, she's always played it safe her whole life. Is that cowardly? Maybe it's selfless. Maybe it's a sign. Um, so, and I, and I, yeah, she wonders, um, she looks about the past, thinks about what might have been. She had passion. Don't you think she had to? And um, <clears throat> and I thought, oh my God, Kitty sees herself. It's like Kitty had this incredible moment of clarity um, reading Mrs. Dalloway, and she saw herself. 
her life, her choices, moments of like pure clarity. And I thought, does she know what just happened? Does she know that she basically um, described her choice, knew what she did, and that this was her life, and that she saw in Ms. Dalloway? Um, and I felt kind of ashamed admitting that <clears throat> out of all the three, <clears throat> Kitty was the only character that I actually liked. And I thought, okay, do I like her because she's she's really seeing what's what's there, seeing herself and her choices, or because she's really the most traditionally female? <laughs> you know. Um, I don't know. Um, so I obviously hated the life she was living. You know, something I would have never done was, you know, be with a boy, and she did. And um, there's a point later in the book where, uh, where somebody says, "Did you really make a choice? You, you were what? You were like, you know, 17, 18 years old. Did you really make a choice?" Um, so she, she was not, you know, she didn't have the opportunity to really make a choice when she was 17 or 18. Um, so I and and then she has this this life that I would have never wanted. So I hated the life she was living, but I really liked her. I liked her. I liked the way that she she um, uh, the self discovery that she went through. Um, I liked the fact that like when I read this passage, I could see, oh my God, she she saw, she knows, she really understands. And I wondered, is this going to be really hard for her um, to to deal with and to and to live? So. Um, you know, there is so much, there is so much, um, about our personal choices. Um, and, you know, one thing I always, it, it, it's the most important stuff in a way. Um, and bear with me for a minute, because when I, when you think about very young people, like adolescents, they think that when they finally have sex, that it's going to somehow dramatically change them, that they are all of a sudden going to be completely different human beings that it's the culmination of intimacy. So, and at, you know, at 16 years old, your naked body is usually the most intimate thing that you have to share with someone. Um, but then the years pass, you know, you, you, you live, you have life, you make decisions, you do things, and then you're 36, 56, 76, and then and you learn that sex is, is not the culmination of in, intimacy, it's just really the beginning. Um, and that the most intimate things you have to share are all those decisions that you made over the year all the things that you did wrong, the times that you failed people, the apologies you never made, um, the, the decisions about, you know, what you're going to do with your life career-wise, um, <clears throat> that you, um, your decision, you may sh maybe you made short-sighted decisions for immediate gratification that wound up having um, either terrible or really inconvenient long-term, you know, long-term um, consequences, and, and you're trapped on the path you set, you know, you failed people who were counting on you. Those things are the most are the most intimate things you have to share. Um, those decisions, the things that made your life, and you know when you're in relationships, um, either friendship or um, uh, an intimate relationship with a primary, you know, a lover, um, sharing that stuff is really the most intimate because those are your choices. And so this personal choice or chance or circumstances are really tied in with our experiencing um, intimacy and. Um, and spirituality. Right. Which brings us to the next theme, the interplay of personal choices, uh, external political forces, and chance in our lives. And this is very much one of the main themes of the book. I mean, it starts out with the, you know, the character sort of trifurcating, and then as it rolls along, you know, you keep having to make choices, and then it's one thing is foreclosed, and then there's no going back. I mean, in some ways, this is a very middle-aged book because you don't realize this when you're 25, but by the time you're 40, you realize, oh, I did this. This means I can't do this anymore. It's done. You know, it's over. Um, and you don't really get a redo on some of that stuff. So, um, and so there's this constant thing about fate throughout the book that sort of threads its way through. Um, you know, is there such a thing as fate? Does she hover over us guiding every toss of the coin or do we collide with her, drawing her attention? Um, you know, are we, is, is she coming to us or are we going to her? And even when we clearly have free will, do we have the courage to use it? If it had been me, Faith is her sister. Um, if it had been me, not Faith, and I'd believe, truly believed I had a vocation, nothing would have stopped me. If I had been the one bleeding on that floor, I would have picked myself up and shaken the dust off my feet as I left that house. If I were called, I'd be capable of crazy things following on water, starving in the desert, waiting for the whisper of my divine lover. 
And this is coming from Kitty. And so what's interesting right here is that, you know, she's sort of shut the door on that calling that she did have when she had that mystical experience as a young child. The other two versions of her did not do that. And they followed the calling. And so <laughs> Antonia, in fact, did follow Josephine across the water and left the dead to bury their own. And they are now starving on that oil platform, um, determined to be breatharians who live on seawater. Um, and meanwhile, Catherine is of course forever waiting for the whisper of the divine lover. She got it once with Morgan, she gets a second time with Amanda and then it's absolutely catastrophic. So she's still waiting. Um, so in fact, it's like she almost can see the other versions of herself and the decisions they made in terms of you know, fate or choice or whatever. Um, anyway, it's just this, this passage was very poignant to me in, at that point in the book. And then um, this is Catherine, who's a doctor, she's working in the ER and Antonia, this is one of the moments where their lives cross. So Antonia comes in to the ER, she's been struck by lightning on the oil platform and they have to bring her to the ER, they have to come back into patriarchy. Um, so, Anto so Catherine is doing this exam, trying to figure out what has happened to this woman, she's half dead, I don't understand. What am I looking at here? It's not an OD, it's not heroin, but what is it? So she smells of the sea and faintly of ozone. Suspicious, I ro roll her on her side and exit burn glows under her left shoulder blade. Fluids push them, it's a lightning strike. I shove an IV into the only vein I can find in her arm. What God have you angered, my dear, I murmur. Her dark eyes meet mine, all pupil, like an opium eater's. I register a shock of recognition. Some become zealots by circumstance, some by hard experience, but we were born fanatic, <clears throat> awaiting our outlet. Why do we cry for the impossible? I've demanded the gods descend to kiss me on the lips. She's demanded they ennoble the human heart. There is no answer to our shout. So. Okay, magical thinking in both political movements and in society at large. So this is again, a huge theme in the book where it all seems to go wrong. Um, so they're on the oil platform and it's starting to get really bad out there. Um, they've, they're have they very much compelled by this vision. Some of the most beautiful passages in the book are Josephine, who's sort of the leader, the ringleader of this whole thing and who uh, Antony is completely in love with. They've been together 12 or 13 years. She, you get to hear Josephine's speeches as she wanders around trying to raise money and get converts to this, this project. Um, and in the beginning of the book, there's a number of her speeches that are you know, just in the text and they're, they're incredible. I mean, you, you totally understand there's the poetry and the fire. You get why any, somebody would follow her across the water to this oil platform because she's absolutely, you know, she's just luminous with this love for women and with the rage of what women are going through around the planet and how this this might be a way that, that we could break, break some freedom out for women. Um, but of course it all goes very, very badly as many of these projects do. And so there's a woman named Sophie who's gonna leave because she sees it's all just gone crazy. But this is her little speech about the, the, um, the, the magical thinking part of it. Um, you know, they're scared, they want to, and there's this woman, Ixnay, who's absolutely impossible. So they did want to listen to her, someone like her. Magic and miracles, yes, yeah, so much faster than sacrifice and struggle, she spits. Do they really think we can win them over? Just us and reason. Nobody likes reason, nobody wants logic. Not here, not on the shore, not anywhere. Until everyone gets over their goddamn emotions and starts to think there'll never be a revolution, just ghost dances. People always believe righteousness changes reality. So human, magical thinking. She wipes her face with her sleeve. You know, we're not the first to screw up. Every kind of separatist movement goes nuts with the purity, but it's not enough just to be an Atlantean. It's a tool, not the goal. Atlantis isn't an identity, it's a strategy. Who cares if we sit out here, the 30 of us, unless we're building a mass movement, unless we're an inspiration to women everywhere? What the hell is the point? I have no answer. So Marion, what do you think about this? <laughs> um. Well, I think, oh, there was a question in the chat. How old was the author when she wrote this? 40, maybe 45. It was okay. published 12 years ago. She's two years older than me. Yeah, she would have been in her 40s. Okay, just a question. Late um, 40s. Yeah, the magic and miracles. Ghost dance, the ghost dancing for people who don't know, um, in the American West, there was, you know, a, a, 
point or Midwest, West, um, there was a point where, um, it, you know, the Indians, Native Americans um, knew that they were being basically decimated and extirpated, um, just, you know, killed and driven from their land, um, their country, as it were, which, you know, they didn't consider to be theirs in terms of possession. Um, so they developed this dance, it was called the ghost dance with these um, special, you know, kind of ceremonies, um, special, um, special practices that had to do with this, this dance. And, um, uh, and they thought that if they did this ghost dancing, that the white men would go away, leave them alone, and they would get, you know, the, you know, place where they were living back, it would be just, it would be all just them again. Um, and they, so they did the, these ghost dancings, and it was really um, just this um, belief that this, that this spiritual thing that they were doing um, would change what was happening externally, which obviously it didn't. It was, it was kind of sad, and they thought that this, um, you know, that this uh, messiah or Walker would come and save them. But um, so that's what I mean. That's what ghost dancing is, and that gives you a, a like a, a an inkling of what they thought that they were doing out there on that platform. That somehow um, it was going to change things, um, and you know, and from our point of view now we can say no it, it, it doesn't do that it doesn't work but back in the day um there were women who believed this and there and there still are and i you know and i i'm i think that um if they had realized that it's fine to have like completely separate what i call refuge and sanctuary that women can go to you know to to, to be um among only women because we all know that the vibe is totally different if there's even one male there um, so I understand um, the desire for refuge, women only refuge and sanctuary, um, but that's what it is, refuge and sanctuary, um, a spiritual place where you get recharged, where you are with um, like-minded people, but then, but then you go out. The refuge and the sanctuary is in the middle of a wider world, um, and if all you're doing is huddling in the refuge and the sanctuary, it doesn't change what's happening in the wider world. I mean, it, it, it doesn't, and, and the wider world may destroy your refuge and sanctuary eventually, um, just because you know you they don't like what you're doing there, or they don't think, or they don't think that you should have it. So this this magic and miracles, um, I, you know, I I I don't I don't know how to. You can't tell people that oh by oh by the way this isn't going to work. They have to learn by having the thing pretty much fall apart and having you know, um, when Antonia just follows Josephine, who she genuinely loves and cares about, off that oil platform um, to, to be with her um, in, a, in a way, you know, to, to help save her life and then to help save her own life. And it was love, human love, not spiritual practice, but human love that got them both, or at least got Antonia off that oil platform. It was the physicality of loving, you know, the, the reality of loving another human being um, that got her to say, um, get the hell off of here. Um, you know, I don't, and I'm sick. She's sick. You know, I'm, I'm getting off of here. Um, rather than just a, um, uh, rather than just a, um, um, I'll say a, I'll say a, a, a you know, a, a prayer or I'll say whatever. Um, you know, you have my thoughts and prayers. No, you have my physical presence. If you, I worked in the ER too. I was an ER doc. Um, and the, if you, if someone who is scared and hurting, um, and really, really sick or very injured, um, when you say, I'm here, I'm here, I'll, I'll take care of you. Those are, those are holy words. Those are sacred words. That is the love of another human being for mm -hmm. another. So yeah, um, go to your refuge and sanctuary, um, to learn how to love each other and then take it out to the wider world. I mean, that's, that's what I, you know, what I thought that, that culmination, you know, because it, it comes sort of near the end, well, or at, near the beginning of the end, um, where um, Antonia meets herself as Catherine in the ER, and it was the, the thing that, that saved her um, was the, the care of another human being. Um, and I understand, if, for Catherine, I understand the love for her was with the, the you know, two women that she cared deeply for and loved deeply in her life. I get that. I mean, I had a partner who I lost, um, greatest love of my life. And, um, and you know, after the loss, um, after a loss like that, when someone dies, 
your life is basically divided into before and after. Um, so I understood that um, in Catherine is that her life is before and after. Um, and and I'm, I was kind of glad that she found at least caring for you know herself in the ER um, was a was an act of love that she could do. Um, but but just like you know saying well hopes and prayers that doesn't make it. Yeah, and this thing about the ghost dance is um, this is the cautionary tale, I think, in this book. And I wish that I had known about some of this when I was younger. <laughs> um, but it's a feature, not a bug, of of humans that under conditions of severe desperation, this is where we go to. This is one of the places that we can try. <laughs> so around the world, you have the, there's the ghost dance. You have the Boxer Rebellion in China. You have the Zosha cattle killing cult. And it's the same thing over and over again, where people think that these sort of extreme spiritual practices are somehow going to save them, that you know, these spiritual help from another realm is going to come and physically stop the terrible things that are happening, that the dead will be re reunited with the living, that the land will be restored, um, you know, all these miraculous things will happen. And it, it has never once worked. So it's good to know that when humans feel desperate that's a place that we are likely to reach. And also to know that whatever strength we do derive from our spiritual connections to the cosmos, it, it's never gonna result in physically changing these bad conditions. It may give us the courage to go on, but you can't count on it as a political strategy because it doesn't work. So it's the same out on that oil platform. Like this was never gonna work. When they start to head in that direction, it's over. It's a done deal. So anyway, um, the tension between this purity um, and engagement or you know, the separatism versus engagement is another way to put that. So um, that is the tension very much in the book. And that in the very beginning, the, in the very first chapter of Antonia telling her part of it, she says, you know, my withdrawal stopped nothing, our withdrawal, the world had pounded on relentless as surf three years we were forgotten like a boat over the horizon. So it made no difference at all what they were doing out there. Yeah, I um, I mean, I came into the women's movement um, in 1969 um, and it was, it was all there for me. I mean, women had, I mean, even for like five years it had been there. Um, and the seventies, people talk about the good old days of the nineties, you ain't seen nothing. <laughs> As she saw the 70s. It was really amazing. This is in the United States. Um, and so, you know, me and my contemporaries had this. We had, we had this, you know, the women's movement. We had everything for women. There were, I mean, there were, and some of it was for lesbians, some of it was for, for all women. There were conscious raising groups, there were bookstores, there were um, there were coffee houses, um, there were bars, there was there was all this kind of stuff. And it kind of even went on into the beginning of the 80s. There was women's music. I mean, you'd go to concerts, all these women and you could keep men, at the time, you could keep men out of all this stuff and they had no recourse. Um, and it was phenomenal. Um, and then, you know, a lot of us, we got older and we decided, and you know, we started pursuing um, careers. Um, some women, initially, you know, um, a lot of women in the women's movement, especially lesbians, weren't having kids, but a lot of women went on to just want to have kids and raise kids. So we kind of left to go do stuff, you know, some for, you know, for, for, for arts, some for, you know, spiritual practices, whatever. Um, and then when we tried to come, thinking it would always be there, then we tried to come back to it, like in the mid 90s, and it was gone. Um, and I know a lot of young women these days talk about the good old days in the 90s, but in comparison to what we had, it was gone and it wasn't the same and it had already started to be kind of, um, you know, uh, touched and, 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 for, and for us oldsters, <laughs> um, kind of, uh, I don't know, I want to say ruined, but really marred um, by, uh, by BDSM and by, you know, other stuff that was going on, um, you know, influence from the outside world. So instead of us being the, uh, you know, the, the sugar and the coffee that, that spice things up, um, the outside world, instead of us being the, uh, what is it, there's some biblical thing about the, the salt of the earth. Um, instead of us being the salt of the earth, it's the whole world was salty and they just totally, you know, the salt just totally destroyed what we had um, or started to destroy what we had. So we thought it would always be there, 
you know, we, we, we just said, oh, we can come back to it. Um, so our withdrawal um, was from what was refuge and sanctuary. Um, we went to the outside world thinking that we could go back to the refuge and sanctuary, but what I, and I, and I understand what she's saying here, but I, I don't forget that um, when we were in it completely separate, we probably should have been doing more um, to, to, um, to influence the outside, but we did what we could, you know, we did what we could, we you know, created women's shelters, we created a lot of things so that women could leave men, you know, and leave the bad things that were happening to them because of, um, because of, you know, how men were treating them. And I kind of get that, but then we just stopped. We just stopped, we figured it would always be there. We figured we didn't have to do any more work. Um, we withdrew from the community and we withdrew from the work outside in the outside world. Um, and I feel, I, I feel very bad about this. And I know a lot of women my age as well um, who feel bad about this. I mean, I had very similar experiences. I'm a little younger than you, but I launched into this as a teenager. You know, I read Andrew Dworkin and Mary Daly when in you know, 1980, I was 16. And then as fast as I could, I found this entire world, this feminist world that had been created um, and participated, you know, until it collapsed. So it, it, I don't even know how young women are managing to be radical feminists without that. Because like you said, it was this entire world you could enter and you never really had to leave it. Like you could just go, I mean, any single night, if you were in a city, you could find, you know, the, a bookstore or a conference or a lecture or the women's center, or, you know, if you, there were the bars, if you drank, but um, there was just this whole world that women had created the music festivals and the conferences, um, so all kinds of stuff to look forward to over the summer that, you know, we're going to go to this one. Um, and then it just, it just all ground to a halt. So um, we need that. Like you have to have that place where you are seen and you are heard and you matter. And that's what we made for each other was we put women at the center and created this whole different world. But there is a tension between a real culture of resistance and a culture that's simply an alternative. And I think that a lot of women lost the plot there, that they thought that this culture would be enough and it never will be. Um, it, it needs to be a springboard for actual a political movement because if you just withdraw, um, it doesn't make any difference. So, and this is a real, I mean, this has been going on in Western culture really since I can find evidence anyway, back to the, the Greeks that there is this impulse of this utopian impulse of withdrawal, um, you know, that you're gonna make this perfect world here on earth even, and sometimes it's more religious and sometimes it's more political, but you can follow this thread, you know, all the way up until you get to things like the Nearings who wrote, you know, the good life books. Um, and that's the whole back to the land movement, but that was not new. You know, they were drawing on this huge tradition that had been going on for thousands of years where various people, again, whether it's religious or not, um, they create this whole other sort of little utopian world for themselves. And sometimes it's about, you know, we can, we'll, we'll, the Shakers are a great example. There's a lot of this in the history of the United States because the country is so big and you could very easily buy cheap land in a rural area and then start your crazy community. Um, my favorite example is always the Shakers because I love them. They did a great job <laughs> with this. And they were also very, very motivated by being egalitarian that the men and the women were gonna be equal. Um, anyway, that's you know a whole other discussion, but we didn't invent this is I guess what I'm saying. We put our own spin on it by putting women at the center, but this has been a thing that's been going on for thousands of years. Um, this sort of tension between, you know, making this perfect utopia and whether or not it works and what effect it has on the bad thing that's outside. And are you actually trying to change the world or do you take this as a given and then you're just going to withdraw from it because it's the only thing you can do, um, you know, against the evil sinful world or is it, are you going to try to change it? So that's, I think, that, that particular tension. And then, you know, Jean Sharp had this great quote. And I remember when I found this, I was like, well, there's three decades of my life, but he says, utopians are often especially sensitive to the evils of the world. They crave certainty, purity, and completeness. They try to reject the evil as much as possible, and they wait a new world, which is gonna come into being by either an act of God, a change in human spirit, some kind of autonomous change in economic conditions, but all of these things are beyond deliberate human control. 
the most serious weakness of this response to the problems of this world is not the broad vision or the commitment of the people who believe in it. The weakness is that these believers have no effective way to reach the society of their dream. And I was like, man, he nailed that. That's it. That was those. That was those two, three decades I lost to this project. We had no effective way to reach the society of our dreams, and so we created this whole other thing, thinking it would be enough. And of course, it wasn't. We needed a political movement. Yeah, there were. I mean, there were a few women in the movement who, who um, were really prescient and spoke about it, and and it kind of just went by the way. I mean. Um, women's music was a big thing. 1982, there was this big women's music conference at Carnegie Hall where I was there. Um, um, I know. Um, and and then shortly after that, things really started to just fall apart. Um, like when you came into it, you came into the beginning of the end. And and one of the one of the you know um, women's music um, singers um, just said um, that she she just didn't want to be a part of it anymore. I guess maybe there were personal issues, but she just saw that it it wasn't working. It wasn't changing the world. It wasn't, you know, it wasn't um, doing good for women um, in the way it should. You know, it. Um, so she kind of just just left um, and and withdrew and and went off. And and other women did that as well. Um, they said this isn't really changing anything, so they went off. And um, maybe some became artists, which is fine, but. Um, it, it is, it kind of withdraws. It's not, it's not, you know, they no longer look politically active, um, things like that. It's, I mean, I, again, I, I always talk about um, the analogy of women being in a POW camp um, and we have to escape from the, no matter what we do, you know, no matter what agency we have, we're making all our decisions um, in the context of being prisoners. Um, and we have to get, leave the POW camp. And then, and I like that you always remind me um, that while we're leaving, we have to like tear it down, <laughs> barbed wire by barbed wire, um, fence post by fence, fence post. Um, so, and 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 you you know, and we have we may have to work, and we have to work with all the women who are escaping to do that, um, right. whether we like them or not. Yeah. Well, and the, and the other thing is, I don't want anyone to walk away from this thinking that I completely reject this project because I don't. It's incredibly important to have women only space. It's incredibly important to have that culture of resistance. It's just that that culture, if it's really gonna be a culture of resistance, it has to see itself as the cradle of the resistance movement. It can't just be about you know, withdrawing for feelings of personal purity. And it can't be about withdrawing as an act of political, like that that is the resistance, cause it's not. Um, all of that is like really important that sense of reclaiming yourself that sense of you know having an experience of liberty of, of actual physical liberty on this planet even if it's just for a weekend we know how transformative that is for women everybody can remember the first time that they got to be in women only space for two or three days you're not the same when you come out the other end of that and that's for real reasons and that's why i'm always sympathetic to any group of people that wants to have their only space, you know, whether it's black women wanting, wanting their only space or, you know, Native Americans, like Jewish women, you pick your group. I understand why everybody needs their space. There's no question that that is absolutely crucial to the, you know, the revolutionary project. You've got, you've got to have those, those times with just each other, but it, it, it can't, it, you can't, you can't separate that from, and just have that be enough because it never will be. You've got to have that you have to understand it as the thing that's giving you, you know, that the courage and the self-love and then the, the group bonding with each other. Like, I just always remember that, that really famous Zaki Shange quote, you know, from her, from, for Colored Girls play about, I found God in myself and I loved her fiercely. And that's what you get in those spaces. You know, that, that self-love that becomes, now you can finally love each other. And then from that, that's the revolutionary love that, that can help you change the world. So it's absolutely crucial to have that kind of separatist impulse. It's just that it's not enough. And when you do cut yourself off from the world like that, all you're left with is personal purity. And that's the other issue is that when, you can't, when you're not fighting up, you're not fighting the men or whoever is coming down on you, all you can do is fight each other. And that's what happens on its horizontal hostility. That's all they've got left on that platform. And they're basically ripping each other to pieces. Um, and demanding further and further acts of purity, which just get crazier and crazier 
you know, they really think that they're going to survive just by drinking seawater. And if you think this is over, it's not because just last week I had a conversation with somebody and I had to tell her she couldn't be a breatharian. I'm like, how is this still happening? <laughs> how, how is this still happening in my crazy little world? Like, and, and yet there she was thinking that she could, maybe this was possible. I'm like, it's not, it's called anorexia. You will die. Please don't attempt this. I've been through this before. Trust me. It's not a thing. You can't do it. You've got to eat. So this comes down to uh, the next theme, our rational versus our animal selves. Um, you cannot yeah, somebody water. in the chat just said food. that uh, women only spaces aren't the same as separatist communities. And that's true. And I've been taking great pains to mention that. Um, and I and I will continue to use the words refuge and sanctuary because we do need refuge and sanctuary to go to. Um, what you know when you when you talked about um, the horizontal hostility, you know, sticking it to the man. Um, among women, one of the uh, one of you know, I mean, the greatest spiritual secret really is, um, and and people would say that it's a, a general spiritual secret is that we are all one. I mean, we are. We are all one. We are all one in the class of human beings um, that are female. Um, who are women? Um, we are all one. And and the the book when you know when they started meeting each other, um, it's like they're all one. Um, and it you know their animal selves when they met each other had done things um, or had lived in ways that were just sort of um, reactive, you know, or were just sort of emotional, um, but really weren't weren't thinking. And when they met themselves. You know, in the ER, and it, you know, when when um, uh, Kitty met herself later on, you know, it, it, the the meetings um, were to help each other or to relate to each other were rational, um, and and that we think of emotions as being loving, but love is really like a decision that you make of how to treat people and what to do. Um, in in some ways, yes, there are feelings. Obviously, there are feelings about it. But the rational approach, you know, um, the way they rationally um, interacted with each other was loving, um, and it's and it it was a, uh, you know, by the way the book was written, um, they are one, they are all one. These three women who came from very different, very different, um, you know, lifestyles because of their choices, were all one because that's the way the book is written. Just this really interesting literary way to do it. Um, but they were all one, and it's it's sort of a microcosm for how we how our activism should be. Um, that we are all one. We have these little, these separate lives. Um, we walk away from you know maybe walked away from activism, maybe walked walked away from previous lives, like Kitty walking away from her uh, um, from her you know life with uh, her husband um, and three kids. Um, we all have our separate lives, but <clears throat> when we when we meet each other, when we meet ourselves, we can only do it when we know that we're all one. Does that make sense? Yeah, and that's and there's that moment on the oil platform where uh, Antonia realizes that she's going to have to leave. That it's and she's yeah. it's breaking her heart, but and she says it's not just because of Josephine, and though she loves Josephine, and Josephine is clearly you know, the love of her life. I mean, she's just, that's it, that, that's her partner, but it's, it's, it's over, she's gonna have to leave. And she says, it's not just because of, I love Josephine, it's the love for all women. That's why I'm here, is because of how much I love every single woman and how much I long for their freedom. And that it's, it's love is what motivated this project, but this, this, is, this is killing us, we can't keep doing this. Um, but that really shines through in the book, I think, for all three of the, the different characters. Um, and Kitty, I mean, it, it's it's really well done that moment when she also realizes this, I have to leave my husband, I need to eat the peach, essentially. Um, she's literally at her father's funeral. So it's, you know, back to that, the dead, leave the dead to bury the dead. Um, you know, and she has, she has to do that and, and go on this, this bigger calling that she has, you know, to reclaim her own life now from the, the bad choice she made when she was 17. Um, the peach is still calling. So 
that was very beautifully done. And the other thing that, um, you know, this whole business about this, you know, the spiritual, um, you know, the, the rational versus the spiritual and all it I, it, I think that that part also was very pointed in the book because the first thing we know about Antonia is she's been through something horrible, clearly. She's very physically fragile, whatever it was nearly killed her. We don't yet know what it was. We, we're, we're let in pretty early that this was some kind of crazy utopian experiment. Um, but her job now is she's a psychic phone phone line and she does tarot readings over the phone. And the point is that, you know, it's not just, I think it's very clear, it's not just like radical feminists who sometimes head for crazy spiritual things. Like it's clear that Anne Marie sees that everybody, you know, has these tendencies because she gets these phone calls, you know, and then she's she's got this whole shtick that she's developed about, you know, being the I am Antonia from Atlantis and I, you know, I have a little gong and I, you know, and she's got this whole way that she speaks that's, you know, like ooh, very, you know, sort of spooky. Um, but, you know, ev everybody, it's, it's a very human impulse that when you are desperate and for most of the women who call the hotline, they're desperate about love. You know, most of them are in bad relationships or, you know, something's gone wrong and they, they're looking for advice and it's, you know, mostly about that. Um, but in times of desperation, they reach for, this sort of spiritual lifeline. Um, and so it's not just, we're not the only ones who did this. This is, you know, very, very, a very common human impulse. Um, and so Antonia is still, that's where she goes to earn a living. And it's, she's still part of it as much as she's laughing about it. She still understands it in a way that, um, you know, is just that sort of common human, human thing. So, yeah. Somebody in the chat said, but there's a stone at the heart of a peach. Yeah, that's how more peaches grow, you yeah. know, um, when you eat the peach um, and the stone falls wherever it does, more community grows, more right. women grow. I mean, that's, you know, it's it's the seed, things, things grow. Um, I'm trying to think of... But it's also I'm, poisonous. You don't want to eat that seed. It's filled with cyanide. No, 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 you don't want to eat it. So eat there's it. both. There's the sweetness and the poison, right? At, at Laetrile, that's what from, from peach. Yeah, that's why I said when it falls, you know, you, you eat the peach and the seed falls where it is and then more peaches grow and they grow from this this thing that is a deadly, <laughs> is a deadly poison. Um, you know, so in the world, which is a deadly poison, you eat the peach, the seed falls and, um, and more good stuff grows. Um, I, I, when you were talking about um, uh, Antonia leaving the the oil rig, um, you know, and she's going through this in her head, and oh my God, blah, blah. I, you know, I'm, I'm like um, thinking, it's like, come on, just make it get off the damn oil rig. Or when Kitty is going through everything and finally realizing it's like, I can't do this. I I need to eat the peach. I'm thinking, it's like, come on, just get to it. I don't think we realize that um, how long it takes for people from the first time that you, they encounter an idea about maybe this other thing is true um, to the time where they embrace it. Yeah, this other thing really is true. That's not, you preach to somebody and a week later they change. I mean, you know, occasionally there are dramatic things. People may have numinous experience, whatever. But for the most part, it takes a long time um, for people to change. Five years, yeah. Five years. It's five five years. Really and I don't, mind about something. Yeah, yeah, so it's not enough to say, by God, they need to know what I believe like fantastic but that doesn't that doesn't change them um and you wind up having to uh interact um with people and work with people that maybe you didn't think you would or didn't want to um i mean andrea dworkin talked about that you know we we work for all all women even the ones we don't like um and antonia got that i think she understood yeah. that and i think that um when she was you know doing this psychic thing she actually was, you know, really perceptive about drawing people out and asking the right questions and getting them to spill their guts. Um, be, because even though she may not have perceived it as such, um, for, for people who call to have somebody do that is like, maybe they're calling because nobody ever does that. And to do that is a really caring thing to do. No, she very clearly cares about a lot of the women who, who call because they have real problems. You know, they're with horrible men. Um, they're, you know, they're either sleeping around on them or, you know, they're, they're violent or, 
you know, they're not getting anything out of this relationship at all. And then there's also a few that call that, you know, they're clearly in love with a woman and they can't quite say it. And so Anthony is like, come on, drop it. I, I know it's a woman. Um, so she's able to see right through that immediately, but she gives them really good advice, all of them. She really does just want the best for them. And she has this much bigger analysis of why they're going through what they're going through. And some of that, some of the passages about that are really quite moving to me as well, because it's, um, you know, again, just that incredible love that she has for women that shines through. Um, and so it's sort of heartbreaking because her utopia has collapsed, but she still, she can't not see what she knows about the state of the world and, and how women are treated. Right. Um, and there's not much she can do about it except give them little bits of advice, but she does what she can. So yeah, but um, then, and then there's, go ahead. I was just gonna say it is a, like we have four minutes left. Um, okay. Is there anything that that you think we haven't talked about that was really important that we can squeeze into three and a half minutes? <laughs> I really want everybody to read this book. I, this book never found the audience it should have because there's there's the one set of people who I think would really like it are the ones who are just into the whole modernist sort of liter, you know, that, that movement. So you have T.S. Eliot and especially Virginia Woolf. Virginia Woolf threads through this entire book over and yeah. over again. And I always thought when, you know, after the first time I read it, I thought what Anne-Marie did with this book because in the book To the Lighthouse, Virginia Woolf's To the Lighthouse, the whole first part of it is they're trying to get to the lighthouse and they never do it. And I thought, oh, she got them to the lighthouse. That's what she did. <laughs> Except it's a hundred years after Virginia Woolf and the world is in such bad shape now that it's a decayed oil platform off the coast of Connecticut. But she gets them there. She absolutely gets them there. Um, so that group of people would really enjoy this book because those are a lot of the themes, but they don't care about it because it's, a radical feminist book too. And these aren't people who particularly care about, you know, the, the stories in this book aren't gonna speak to them. So that's a problem. And then you have the radical feminists who are mad because A, the utopian experiment goes completely dystopian um, and it's not all elves and strawberries. Like there's a lot of mystical stuff in this book, but it's not particularly pleasant. You know, it's not the universe that we want, it's the universe we've got. And I, I don't think a lot of women it, that doesn't really resonate with a lot of, they want it to be this beautiful, you know, lovely, you know, goddess full, whatever, like, you know, all love and light. And it's just not, it, that's not what's going on. So at, on both ends, it's like, ah, uh, I want them to read this book. So I'm just going to encourage you all to read it. It is very beautiful and there's a lot to think about. So read the book. Yeah, I, um, I mean, I was drawn in right away. Um, and you know the the first chapter where she's she's an adolescent thinking about eating a peach it's just like i mean it's, it sets the i mean it's talking about the, the writing itself i mean it sets the stage as like oh this is a this is a kid a teenager who's going to make a decision and then immediately seeing oh my god there's three ways it could go i mean i don't you know i don't think there's any of us that can look back and say if i had chosen this versus that um, somebody asked me once, do you think there's a heaven? And I said, I don't know. But if there's a heaven, um, what it is is that you will get to live the life you could have had. Mm -hmm. um, that, you know, that all those little choices, if I had done this instead of this, if I had decided this instead of this, if I had gone to this college instead of that college, um, not that you would be completely like a billionaire or have completely different parents, but if your parents was a, were abusive, they wouldn't be. Um, heaven is you get to live the life you could have had. Um, if you had made the decisions that 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 you now know, oh, I could have done that. Um, and so, you know, that's kind of a mystical part of it as well. Um, but I, you know, it was it was really it was well written. Um, meeting themselves was just really that was, that was fun. That was like yeah. the best some of the best parts in the book. Yeah. So um, I'm yeah. glad I read it. Good. I think we're uh, we're done. We're about out of time. Um, yeah, we are. All right. Thank you very much, everybody. Thanks. Thanks for being here.